Uh, so it's all yours, Lydia. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, good afternoon. Uh, uh, so happy to see uh, students and faculty who have taken time to join this platform. Um, uh, sir has uh, very kindly introduced me. Uh, I know Sir Tipeswami, Sir, for the last five years. Uh, and uh, thank you, sir, for giving me this opportunity and Gina for uh, providing this platform. Uh, so the topic that I will be talking is um, on tracheostomies and laryngectomies. As a student, I remember I was very scared of a tracheostomy. I hardly saw a tracheostomy in ICU setting and uh, the first time I was there, I was very scared and I said, let the senior nurse handle a tracheostomy patient. So anything to do with airways is challenging. Um, but um, I have been working here in St. James's Hospital here in Dublin for the last four years. I worked on an ENT ward, which had purely tracheostomies. And I was shocked uh, to see the number of patients having tracheostomy. So I kind of developed interest and I have um, uh, working as a specialist in that. So today, uh, the terms and the uh, conditions that I will be telling, we may not be very familiar, but it's a good opportunity to just get to learn uh, more about it. Okay, so there will be some things that you may not, you may hear it for the first time. So uh, at the question and answer session, uh, you can ask me and then uh, we will have quite an interactive session after that. Okay, so uh, to start off with, uh, I will be doing my screen share. So you can see the slides. Sorry for that. Yes. So this little lovely necklace that you see around the neck. Okay. So there is a lot going on behind it. Okay. So we will see what it is all about. Okay. So when you speak about tracheostomy, so as you know, opening, it's an opening which is made in the neck. So going through the anatomy, you already know all this, but I will briefly tell you uh, our airway respiratory system. You have your nasal passage, that is your nose. Okay, so you have your nasal passage, then you have your throat, which is your pharynx. And then just below the pharynx, you have something called as your voice box, which is called a larynx. Okay, below that is your trachea. So trachea is otherwise called as the wind pipe, okay? And um, so tracheostomy is basically an opening which is made in the trachea, okay? In the cartilaginous rings, trachea has these little rings you can see. So usually an opening is made between the second and the fourth uh, ring, okay? Just behind the trachea is your esophagus. That is where your food goes through in. Okay, so uh, I won't be uh, spending much time on this because you know it. Uh, so if it's a surgical tracheostomy, you can see uh, it is done in theaters. Uh, what they do is the surgeon opens, does a surgical incision and he opens the area here in front of the neck and makes a hole in the trachea and puts in the tube. So we will see all that. So clear with tracheostomy. You can use your uh, chat box if you have any questions. I think they can do that, isn't it, sir? That's right, yeah, yeah. Yes, Sorry, yes. So thanks Thanks for reminding, yes. Yes, you type, can use Type your in your chat. questions and type in your questions in the chat box. And those, who, those guys who are watching on the YouTube, uh, please do type in your questions. We'll answer your queries at the end of the session. Thank you. Okay. And if I ask you something, maybe you can give me a thumbs up or something like that, just for me to know that uh, you're able to get what I'm saying. Okay, sure. uh, so we try and make it interactive. Okay, so 
what is the need for a tracheostomy? Why should someone have a tracheostomy? Not all, all patients would have a tracheostomy. So there are many reasons, but I will just briefly tell you uh, what could be the probable reasons. So if there is any, the first and the foremost thing is if there is any obstruction in the upper airway, it could be an infection, it could be any kind of tumors. Okay, so sometimes we just get patients with strider, they would have just come in, they are totally out of breath, they are at home and they just cannot breathe and they are making different noises and they are struggling for breath, they would come into the ward, they would come into A&E and, uh, on, uh, and on assessment, you, you will know that there is a tumor which the patient doesn't know that there is a tumor that was growing which was causing obstruction. So it could be a tumor, it could be anything, you know, and usually in ENT and max facts, uh, if there are tumors in the neck, so uh, what, what, what we normally do is uh, they do a tracheostomy for patients so that it reduces the post, uh, post-operative swelling. So in order to recover in their post-operative phase, uh, patients have tracheostomy. So once the swelling is gone, they are recovered, then the tracheostomy is closed. So it could be different reasons. So now we all know the famous COVID. Okay, so this is a big, big problem here. So in ICUs, if patients are on ventilators, so usually after uh, say 11 to 14 days, they cannot have the ET tube in place for so many days. So you have to switch if they're still oxygen dependent, okay? So there needs to be an other way. So intensivist or ICU specialist opt for putting in a tracheostomy tube so that even if they're off ventilator, they are able to still clear secretion. So this I think you are familiar with. Some patients are not able to be, they cannot be extubated easily, okay? So every time you extubate, uh, within few hours, again, they go back on ventilator. So you cannot keep putting the ET tube back in again and again. So uh, if there is a failure to extubate, then they would uh, opt for doing a tracheostomy. Okay, then there are other uh, problems as well. So if patients are having difficulty in uh, uh, clearing their secretions, okay, chronic respiratory failure, or even patients with burns. Some of you would know that if a patient comes in with burns, so the only way, because you know in burns, there is swelling and there can be closure of the respiratory tract. So in order for that, they would use um, a, a surgical tracheostomy to, to aid in the clearing of secretions. And then uh, these are rare conditions okay, if a patient has a stroke or a bilateral vocal cord palsy, so that's when a tracheostomy can be done. Okay, so there are different reasons um, and indications for which we do that. So coming next to the types of tracheostomy, they can be classified. Okay, they can be temporary. For example, if some patient is coming for a neck dissection, okay, some, some, some lump found in the neck, so they come in for surgery. So just for the period of the surgery, they would have a tracheostomy. Once the neck is healed, as I told, they, uh, the tracheostomy is removed and, and, and it, the stoma is closed. So it be for temporary reasons, okay. And then they can be for long-term, long-term or permanent. So here uh, I have seen that patients, some patients go home with tracheostomy and they have to care for themselves at home because uh, if they are not able to clear their own secretions, if the tumor is not operable, that means there are some kind of tumors you cannot operate, some kind of cancers that cannot be operated. Uh, so they those patients end up with permanent tracheostomy or some patients who are end of life care, okay? So those patients, we would not be doing any kind of surgery or anything like that. So we, we send them home uh, with a tracheostomy. Okay, so again, they can be divided as elective, so that is planned. Patients have booked their operations, so they come in. And then other, otherwise you can have an emergency tracheostomy where they 
they are not aware of what is happening their breathing pattern changes and they are just rushed to the hospital and then they come to know that they have some kind of tumor which is a shock for patients okay so so we come across different uh, uh, types of patients who would end up with a tracheostomy so again there are uh, different methods of inserting a tracheostomy so if it is um, a, an emergency and an elective it could be a surgical tracheostomy which i will tell you and percutaneous the second type is percutaneous so what happens in a surgical so surgical here as you see surgical tracheostomy is done by either ent or max fax team or cardiovascular team so these patients are taken to the operating theater and there they have the surgical incision okay so i won't be telling you more about it but as we go further we'll explain okay so as i told you it's a surgical incision between the second and the third and the or the third and the fourth that is ideal so there there are different um, um techniques of incisions some people just like to make a square window some people like to have a longitudinal uh view so it's it's it depends on the surgeon however whatever is the type of the thing uh, of the incision um uh it is all documented so that we know what kind of incision the patient has had okay so just for you to remember you don't need to remember know much about this there is only two types surgical and percutaneous percutaneous is a bedside procedure okay usually if if anyone has worked in icu you will know this so usually what happens the intensivist or the icu consultant they come in and they just do this procedure bedside they see they ask the nurse how many days has the patient been ventilated or intubated if they say 11 12 days then they'll be like okay get me the tracheal tray i will uh, uh, i will do a procedure so it's it's a bedside procedure okay so it is um, it is this is the kind of tube that they use uh, it's called a dilator and they do it at the bedside okay so what as a nurse now as a nurse what you need to know we will be concentrating on that so if it is a surgical tracheostomy when the hole is formed it takes about 3 days okay roughly about 3 days for the hole to form okay but if it is a percutaneous tracheostomy it takes about 7 days okay 7 to 10 days for the hole to be uh, properly formed so what does it mean why you must be asking me why are you telling me this it just means that if the tube falls out okay that is where the problem is if the per percutaneous uh, tracheostomy if the tube falls out uh, be before the third or the fourth day in the early uh, week it's difficult to put the tube back in okay so it the 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 tube will the the skin will just close quickly and you will not be able to put the tube back in so that is why it is very important to know whether it is a surgical or a percutaneous if it is a surgical after 3 days the the stoma is well formed okay so now coming to what is this tracheostomy i'm going on telling you from that time so what is it exactly so we'll just know we'll just quickly see what are the parts of a tracheostomy tube so i have uh, with me a sample so i'll show you can you all see it maybe give me a thumbs up if you can see it yes we can yes okay very good so so this is a tracheostomy tube and i work with these tubes all the time okay so what does it mean uh, it, this so the parts of the tube so it's a double lumen tube that means there are two hole two two lumen so you can see this so it's you have the outer ring this is the outer ring and this is the inner inner cannula okay so it's a double lumen tube okay these things 
these things can you see these two things it's called a flange i'll just mark it and show you here as well these things are is called a flange so i will be referring to these things in the next few slides that's why i'm just telling you what these mean okay so uh, this is the cuff can you see this balloon like thing it's called the cuff so so and this is called the pilot the blue thing okay the blue thing it's called the pilot so on this pilot usually the number of the size the size of the tube is written okay it's written on this and it is also written on the flange so i can just look at it and say what size the tube is because it is written on this this particular tube has an additional feature called as a subglottic port okay so in simple to explain when the tube is in the neck okay and if the balloon is up okay it is called a cuffed tube cuff inflated okay inflation means air is inside if i take off the air okay if i just use a syringe and take off the air okay this cuff is deflated okay this cuff is deflated so what does it mean it just means that the, uh, you can classify these tubes based on cuff inflation and cuff deflation and there are other i will show you uncuffed tubes and cuffed tubes so the main uh, use of these cuffed tube is you know when the tube see nothing nice comes out of these tubes when you suction okay there is lot of secretion which is sitting inside the lungs and there is some secretion sitting outside the lungs so when the cuff is inflated you can use this port to suction okay to suction and whatever uh, material or whatever mucus or whatever is sitting above this cuff you can take out the using a syringe you can able to you can be able to draw it okay so this is the subglottic port okay so you just use this syringe and you can draw out the secretions okay uh, i'll tell you why so this is basically a tracheal tube so can you just give me a thumbs up if you all are, if you all have understood what it is well i yeah? do yes yes okay cool cool okay so this is basically how it looks okay so one more thing what you need to know is called as an obturator okay obturator this is like a guide wire so what happens when when we are putting in the tube this usually just helps to guide to go in okay so what we do is we just it it comes in three packed like this okay so you just lubricate you put the tube in and then you have to immediately take it out so this is like a little guide wire so obturator so why i'm telling you all this is you need to know uh, the parts and uh, and also to have them at the bed side if if the tube falls out okay so coming back to the different types of tubes as i showed you a uh, cuffed cuffed tube you can see the balloon is inflated okay if uh, non cuffed tube is it's a plain clear tube can you see there is no cuff at all okay you cannot see anything it's just plain simple tube okay so that is one way of classification the second way of classification is fenestrated non fenestrated fenestrated means you can you see the difference there is there are tiny windows or holes okay so here can you see there are just tiny holes or windows okay so these are called as fenestration so even the this is called an inner cannula even the inner cannula will have a, a, a tiny fenestrations which means when the patient is able to speak obviously when the patient has a cuffed tube there is no air that can come out through the mouth so he cannot uh, be able to speak but when he is using or when she is using a 
fenestrated tube that is a tube with the little holes that means air is coming out and it is passing through the vocal cords and it, and the patient is able to speak okay and then again you have cuffed non fenestrated so there are different um, types uh, so we will decide according to the patient's status what kind of tube to use okay so these are normal tubes so what are the factors that influence the tube choice can i put in any kind of tube for any kind of patient no there is some guidelines that i need to follow um or the 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 surgeon will tell us what kind of tube the patient will need okay so first if the patient is in icu for example now you think patient is in icu and you know i won't uh, and the patient will need oxygen that is why he is in icu and he is ventilated okay so for that kind of patient you will need a cuffed tube did i, I showed you that it's a cuffed tube a, a balloon which is inflated so that all the oxygen from the ventilator is going into the patient and there is no escape okay so you need a cuffed tube so the problem now is this cuffed tube you can't just leave it in like that you need to keep checking something called as the cuff pressure okay so you see this tiny instrument here has anyone seen it before we can't see it sir no idea yeah. uh okay sorry one second this instrument yes yes we can yeah yeah so yeah. this is called as a cuff pressure manometer okay so it's okay on my slide you can see yes can you see so yes. so what is the reason that you need to check your cuff pressure it is quite self explanatory so you know about pressure ulcers you have been learning about it so pressure ulcers can happen even inside okay so imagine this this balloon which is inflated like this over inflated okay it is putting pressure on the trachea yeah and you know it's all very soft inside so sometimes patients can develop pressure ulcers okay uh, or any kind of uh, like more complications like tracheomalacia or anything like that if the patient uh, if we are not checking the cuff pressure can you see this yes yeah so it's it's very important that we maintain a normal pressure okay so so this instrument it is only come out now it is it wasn't there before okay so so here it just what you do is you just use this cuff pressure manometer at the end of the pilot and you put it this way it will tell you it has a needle okay it has a needle it will tell you in which range it should be so there is a green range okay there is a green range usually the needle should be inside that okay if it is more than that if the pressure now it is showing 60 usually the pressure is between 25 to to 32 cm of water because that is the usual capillary pressure inside our trachea okay so if it is 60 it is obviously over inflated so we just use there's a little red button we remove the air from there and we just and now the needle is back into uh, the green range okay so you might say i don't have this instrument so what how will i do okay so usually what we do when we just put in 5 to 7 ml of air into this okay so that's the simple method just make sure that you have 5 to 7 ml of air uh, which is pushed into it which equals to the pressure that you need so so this helps in preventing pressure ulcers the right cuff pressure okay if it is lower okay if the cuff pressure is too less now what what you think will happen if the cuff pressure is too less you check on your assessment you see that there is it's completely deflated what what would happen the answer is there so it just means that 
the patient is risk of aspirating. So it does not serve any purpose. So whatever secretion is sitting above this cup, it's silently leaking into the lungs. Okay, it can be feed, it can be your, uh, your food, NG feed, anything. It can silently, if the patient is aspirating, it can silently go into the lungs. So it is not doing any harm. So that's a little bit of coughed uh, tracheostomy uh, tube. Okay, then as I already told, if the patient is good, um, he has recovered better and uh, you can switch him to a fenestrator tube, which will help in speaking. And some patients uh, who have some abnormality in the neck, okay, so we are using very big, huge tracheal tubes. They can be a little scary, okay, but they have markings here. So it just tells you, uh, so it's, it, it's different, different types of tubes. You don't need to be bothered about all that. So you just know cuffed tube, non-cuffed tube, fenestrated, non-fenestrated. Is that clear? Okay, so what do you need to know as a nurse? Okay, as a nursing student, what if you are given a patient with a tracheostomy, what do you need to know? You need to know your local policies. Okay, what is your local policy? What is it saying? Okay, and you should ask, you should ask yourself these questions. Why does the patient have a tracheostomy? Like, so then you go back to the indications. Okay, he had, for example, okay, he had a road traffic accident. That is why he has a tracheostomy. So you need to know these things. Why, when, when was it put in? Uh, was it surgical or percutaneous? When was it put in? Because if you know this, you know, even if the tube falls out, you need not worry if it is more than seven to 10 days. Okay, if it is less than two days, he has just come from theater and the tube fell out, will you just be calm? No, you have to, you have to, it's an emergency. So it's very important that you know when, okay, and was it surgical and the size and the type, okay. So it's, it's self-explanatory so that you have the right size of tube when the tube falls out, okay. So later on you are, as you do your physical assessment, you should, you will also check for how the patient is coughing, uh, whether he's able to swallow. So here we have something called as speech and language therapist, okay? So they kind of just assess for swallowing and uh, all that. So uh, relays with them often. And then your main work as a nursing student or as a nurse is to check the inner cannula, okay? So this is the inner cannula. So every four hours, you need to check the inner cannula so that sometimes the secretions get caught up in this and it blocks the tube. So that is why you need to keep checking the inner cannula. So it's not that if the, if the tube is blocked, you take out the tube. No, that is why we have a double lumen uh, tube. Okay, so the emergency bedside equipment. So this is one of the things that is very, very important. So we call this a tracky tray. So what happens is uh, if, if we get to know that we are getting a patient from ICU or from, from anywhere that a patient has a tracky, uh, tracky in place, we set up the room. So when you set up the room, so you need to make sure that the patient has oxygen, humidification, and the suctioning equipment. Okay. So ensure that you have the correct size suction catheters. So if you have seen, this is a suction catheter. Are you familiar with this? Yeah. 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 So suction catheters, suction machine. And so, uh, we just have introduced something called as a tracky tray. So it has the, uh, it has spare tubes basically. Okay. It just has a spare tubes and we have something called as a tracky dilator. I will show you what, what is the use of it. It's a tracky dilator. That means when the tube falls out, you keep the stoma opened. Okay, and then there are a few other things uh, that are there in the tracky tray. So as a nurse, if uh, or as a nursing student, you if they tell you, oh, we are getting a patient, you should be able to set up the room to receive the patient. Okay, then as, as usual, then you need um, sterile uh, 
inner cannula. So you get a box of disposable inner cannulas and then you need uh, water for suction or saline for suction. So this is all uh, according to your local policy. Okay. So now you have a patient who's there for say two, three days and you're every day you're posted to the same patient. Uh, so what will you be checking? So you will, as if you have a patient with a tracheostomy, it's important that you check the site, okay? You make sure that the site is clean, okay? You make sure that the site is clean because you see there are, as, as I have told you that there are pressure sores inside, they can be pressure sores just under the skin here, okay? So this is a this is called the flange, as I told you. So the, the, the flange is putting pressure on the neck. So if you do not inspect the site and see, there can be a pressure sore. And there have been like grade two, grade three, very, very bad pressure sores if a patient is not checked. So you clean as, uh, it, you just clean it as, a ster as a sterile as you can using normal saline. So you put, According to your local policy, you can put Vaseline uh, to just keep it nice and moist. Okay, so and check for signs of bleeding. So uh, usually we just put a thin dressing just below the flange here. Okay, this is the flange. You just put a thin dressing below the flange. Sometimes uh, some patients are come with uh, the flange sutured in. And they have, you can see, can you see this black thread here? Yes. Stay suture, do not remove. So usually surgical patients have this thing called as stay suture. That means when the surgeon is operating, he'll just put that stitch. So if the tube accidentally falls out, you pull the stay suture into opposite. You just pull it this way. So when you pull it into opposite direction, the hole is, you can... See, it collapses. Once the tube falls out, it collapses. But if you pull it, you can keep the hole open and the tube can go in again. Okay, so it's a stay suture. So we keep that in at least for 10 days. Okay, now coming to uh, the ties. Okay, so there are different kinds of ties that you tie it with. Have you tied, have you seen uh, patients with ties? Yes? No. Yes. yes, so it's called as cotton ties. This is what we normally use anywhere. So one thing is, I won't show you how to tie it because you know, but don't be making nice pretty bow like this. Okay, don't just make a nice bow which looks nice. It doesn't help. The patient will pull it out and take out the tube and run. So don't do that. Make a tight knot, at least two, three knots. Okay. That is what you need to do. And uh, don't make it too tight so that the patient will have again a pressure ulcer because it's a very delicate area. So you see here how the patient, uh, you need to have at least one finger space. Okay, just to have, just to make sure that it is not too tight and restricting. So we have, uh, we are using uh, Velcro ties here. Okay, so it's just, using velcro ties so there are two different uh, ties okay and it's it's a soft part and the, the little rough part the soft part goes onto the skin of the patient and and then you just put this so these kind of things you can use for patients who who can understand and who know things not for a confused or an agitated patient he will just pull out the tube and off he will go so uh, this is one more thing that you need to check. So as you are checking your daily assessment, just make sure if the, if the ties are too dirty, please don't leave it on. Change them and uh, you can change them at least once a week. Okay, so as you know, the next thing is humidification. You know, for us, normal, you and me, we, we have cilia in our nose, which will help to humidify our air. That means the temperature, the room temperature is different and the temperature in our body is different. So we want the air to be humidified. So, but in case of a patient with tracheostomy, he does not have this option because 
this part is bypassed his airway is starting from the neck so he does not cilia don't have any role to play in this thing so we have to artificially humidify so there are different things that are available so it's important to know what kind of humidification fits the patient okay sometimes if you just give plain oxygen it can just it can dry out okay it can dry out the secretions and the patient will be in more trouble so it so in order to get oxygen which is humidified here we use something called heated humidification it's called an air vo okay it uh, they set it up at a different temperature and and you can give up to 15 liters of oxygen through this machine so this this part of the thing uh, it fixes on to the tracheal tube and and the patient gets oxygen there are some things called as this uh, this uh, heated humidification uh, is recommended for patients who just come in from theater okay so who are still oxygen dependent we would give that and he's still not mobile but once the patient is mobile he wants to go down to the shop or he wants to walk around so he you cannot take this tube everywhere and go so the patient will have something called as a bib uh, it's like how children have bib if something falls you know so in order to keep it clean so it's this is called a bib so it is uh, air oxygen passes through this okay as you see it is quite transparent okay air oxygen passes through it and it still uh, call uh, causes humidified air to pass through okay so this tube uh, this uh, sorry this uh, bib can be washed and it can be reused uh, and this is what we tell patients and then there's another thing called as hme so can you can you can see this green uh, green thing here so this is again what just fits on to the tracheal tube like this okay just fits on to the tracheal tube and it has an additional feature where you can give oxygen also okay if you don't need to give oxygen that's fine the patient just wears this and he can Uh, he can stay with it okay so it, it it is discarded you cannot reuse it once it is dirty so are you guys clear are you following just give me a thumbs up yes okay okay i think they look like they are following <laughs> okay that's good that's good because i don't want to just go on <laughs> it, it, it's all it's all muted so that's the reason no know. problem no problem that's just over the uh, in, in, in interruption in the middle yeah yes 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 okay shall we carry on yeah okay okay the next part is your suction okay so suctioning is in simple i know they have different um, uh definitions so i would just say that removal of secretions okay pulmonary secretions uh, is suctioning so you use obviously you need a suction catheter so the thing is now how do we how do i know what size catheter to use okay so there is a little formula that uh, we use here okay so i'll tell you uh, even more shortcut formula so if the size of the tube is 8 so you just add plus 4 okay whatever is the size of the tube tracheal tube you just add plus 4 so how much is it 12. 12 okay so you pick up that size 12 you pick up the size 12 suction catheter so it's important that you have the right diameter of the suction uh, catheter so suctioning you all know it's a sterile procedure so you use your sterile gloves hmm? so especially now with covid i'm sure that you are all very familiar with your ppe okay so you use your apron gloves uh, fluid shield uh, mask okay catheters sterile gloves so these are the equipment that you need and when you suction you just go pen size okay the size of a pen don't go too much don't go just you have markings here i would just go about 9 to 10 okay have that in okay and then uh, in icu you usually pre oxygenate the patient and you give so you put it in okay 
and then using your negative suction uh, pressure, you, you just bring it out. So this inserting this catheter should not be more than 15 seconds. Don't leave it in for a long time, okay? It should just be a quick thing, okay? So you can just go in and out. So that is your suction. I'm sure you all know it. You just need to practice it. Okay, so the next part is communication. As I told you, it's very difficult for patients with a tracheostomy tube to communicate and you have different devices now. Okay, so usually patients are frustrated that they cannot speak and especially if they cannot read and write, it is even more difficult. We can see the frustration that they cannot uh, be, able to, be able to tell us what they need. But uh, there are some devices that have come into uh, the market that help us, uh, help the patients to speak. So these are called as speaking valves, okay? So it's, it's a lot, I can't be explaining everything, but I'm just giving you a gist of it. So it's called, you can have a look at it. Uh, it's called a passive speaking valve or a PMV. So these kind of uh, devices are used on fenestrated tubes, okay? Um, or you can use it on a non-fenestrated tube as well. So what happens is when the tube is still in place, these, uh, these little things are just placed above, okay, on the cannula, okay? It, it's just placed above. So when the patient is has this tube and he wants to speak, it's a one-way valve, okay? So he's able to automatically take in air and when he wants to... Uh, it, it opens only once, okay? So the, ox, the air just flows inside. And when he wants to say something, the air is directed back through his vocal cords and he's able to make some uh, speech. Okay, so it's a lot. So it will need a different session on its own. Uh, so, but just to tell you that there are devices that are available for the patient to speak. So the only thing is, do not use these tubes, uh, do not use the speaking valve when the cuff, if your cuff is inflated. If the cuff, if this cuff is inflated and you're using the speaking valve, the patient is going to choke and die. So be very careful that if you're, if ever you're going to use uh, a speaking valve, that the cuff is deflated. So uh, that's the thing. So these are reusable ones. You just wash them and uh, you can put it on. So usually we use, the, use it on patients who are, uh, who are able to understand. Even if they are choking or anything, they can just, they should be able to take it out. Okay. So do not use it at night or when the patient is asleep. Okay. So they, you can wash it and use it again. Okay. So this is Passimur valve. So uh, you can make a note of it and read about it. If you want, excuse me. Okay. Okay, coming to the next thing. Um, an overbed sign, which is very important, okay? what it is this this is an overbed sign it will tell you what kind of a, a tracheostomy the patient has had okay whether it's a percutaneous or a surgical and uh, and behind it you can see this and behind it is an algorithm that means what to do if there's an emergency just a second I think uh, India has gone on mute, uh, Suresh.
Yes. Uh, sorry about that. Okay. So um, it's just that every patient should have an, uh, a little bed sign, okay, uh, which tells them what whether it's a tracheostomy or a laryngectomy, and then you have the algorithm which we will go through in the next few minutes. Okay, so all this is nice. It's all good. The tube is in the in place. Everything is good. But the actual problem starts when there is a an emergency situation. So today I want to just tell you like what you need to do if there is a problem. Okay, so usually there are different types of problems that you and me working on a busy ENT or a surgical ward will have accidental decannulation. So if the tube falls out, what are you going to do? Are you going to run away from there? Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I would have ran away if I was a student. <laughs> <laughs> I would be like, oh, I don't know what to do, but uh, unfortunately or fortunately, I have to face it. Okay. You, so you might be scared. You might be scared. Definitely. It's a very, very scary, uh, scary uh, time where the patient is going all blue and he's like <gasps> breathing that way and you don't know what to do. So you are also breathing the same way. So everyone is in a panic. Okay. So there are different... Uh, scenarios which can put you into a panic like that but today we want to just break that fear you know uh, and we should know exactly what what to do okay so i'll be going through these things okay so here is your friend if there is an accidental decannulation i, I was talking to you about the emergency tracky tray so bedside tray so every patient should have a spare tracky tube it's not that the tube falls out that time you're going and searching in the ward and then it's not there, then you're going to the neighbor ward. No, 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 don't, don't. <laughs> that is the common scenario. And then that nurse won't give you. She said, you took last time, you didn't give me back. So this is, <laughs> this is, we have all gone through it. Yes. Okay. And then, uh, and, and you're here and you want to just run home and not come back. <laughs> so we don't want that kind of a situation. So it's important that you set up your bed space. Okay. So you have your tracky tray bedside. And then, uh, so we recommend that even if the, even if the tracky tube falls out, yes, immediately call for help, which we, we know how to do <laughs> call for help. Okay. So what you as a nurse there, you can be a hero here, okay? Uh, by not running away, but by staying with the patient and telling the patient and reassuring the patient, and you can use this tracheodilator, okay? So you can use the tracheodilator and you can open and keep the space, keep the trache um, stoma open. So you have this here. So you use it in north south position, okay? You keep the stoma open. So till your friend or your colleague go, goes and gets help, you can be there and do this. Nothing is going to happen. All you need to do is keep this open and apply some oxygen. All you need is oxygen. Okay, so accidental decannulation from next time, you all will be heroes at it. Okay, so, so administer oxygen. Okay, uh, so I would recommend that you give oxygen from the face uh, that's the nose and mouth and also through the stoma so you don't know which is working so you just give that and uh, you can have the next size tube ready or a size smaller usually we tell us have a size smaller because if the stoma has closed off it's easier to put in the size smaller okay so who would you call here uh, it depends now we usually call the anesthetic on call because some people think that they need to call me. <laughs> so they will ring me, but I'll be somewhere else. It will, it will take me 10, 15 minutes or they'll think I should ring the consultant of this patient because he is taking care of this patient. No, it's not. Consultant is busy somewhere else. So you call the anesthetic on call. 
okay anesthetist on call he is available and they will be the ones who are in the hospital 24 bar 7 so they can come in and they can do the put in a tube uh, put in a tube but if you are competent you can put in the tube which uh, will need some training as i told you about the stay suture so you pull that stay suture this way and the hole is opened so the tube can just go in straight away okay <clears throat> so the next most common problem is tube occlusion okay so if the patient is having lots of secretions and you haven't checked the patient you saw the patient at 8 a.m when you started and now it is 12 you haven't seen the patient in that four hours there are loads of things that can happen okay the tube can be occluded okay with secretions or anything and here the patient you are going to check the saturation saturation is showing 80 percent and now you are all scared you're panicked what to do okay so the first thing that's why you have an inner cannula so your first thing is assess the patient you check the inner cannula okay and if it is if it is blocked okay if it is blocked you take it out throw it put a fresh one if if it is not okay and still the patient saturation is 80 percent it's not coming up then you suction the patient okay you suction the patient and you see when you suction the patient you can see resistance that means it is it is hitting something it's not going in properly okay that means the patient there is some problem okay there is some problem if the suction catheter you are not able to pass there is some problem that means the i won't tell you more in detail but it means that if, if it looks nice and neat from here if it looks nice and neat from here and if you cannot pass the suction catheter it means it's sitting in the false passage false passage so it's hitting it's sitting it's 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 outside nice like this you think everything is fine but it is sitting somewhere here okay so when you suction it's uh, hitting resistance so in that case here we just tell them if it is sitting in the wrong place you take out the tube but you follow your local policy and you can find out what they, what they do because even few minutes few seconds is important patient can have a hypoxic brain injury if the oxygen is not delivered to the system so we tell that you take out the uh, you take out the tracheal tube and again you just use you go back to your previous method of keeping the stoma open until you get help all right the third one is your cardiac arrest situation. I'm sure nobody wants to be in this situation, but unfortunately, some of us have to be in that kind of situation. So unconscious patient, you have gone, knocked the door, seen that the patient is not responding, has a tracheal tube in. So it's a very scary thing, okay? So you start off your BLS straight away, okay? 30 compressions, two breaths. So now the problem is, you can't give how are you going to give oxygen how are you going to give oxygen if the patient has it's not like your normal uh, it has a different airway so how are you going to give oxygen so there is something called as catheter mount okay cath mount they use this thing in icu okay and every emergency trolley will have a catheter mount okay cath mount so what you do is this the tube is in here so this part fits in here okay and this part is connected to your ambu and then you can give oxygen so remember these things okay these are this is called a catheter mount okay so that's your arrest situation okay so that's how you do use it you can see ambu attached to 15 liters and then you follow the same thing make sure you see your chest twice okay that's fine the next thing those are your three emergencies now mr x or mr y has had a tracheostomy his surgery is over now he no more needs the tracheal tube so we call removal of the tracheal tube as 
decannulation. Okay, so when we remove the tracheal tube, it looks like this. So it takes about seven to ten days or seven to fourteen days. It depends from patient to patient for it to heal up. <coughs> Sorry. So you put an airtight pressure dressing, and it is inspected uh, every day or two days to see that it is clear. Okay. The so in this, then the patient is back talking, back swallowing, and doing things uh, as normal. Okay, so that's about your tracheostomy. Little bit about laryngectomy, I will tell you, not much in detail. Here, what you need to remember is a larynx is complete removal. Uh, remo complete removal of larynx is laryngectomy. So here, there is no connection between upper airway and low and and your lower airway here. Okay, so you cannot intubate the patient. So we have had a, a patients. Like there are there there have been researches where uh, a neck breather. Okay, this is a neck breather. That means the nose and all that is still there. You can physically see, but there is no connection in internally. There is no connection between nose mouth. So even if you put the tube, it it's only going to hit the esophagus, but it's not going to go. You are going to intubate the stomach, but you are not going anywhere into the lungs. So this is something that you need to know. I personally have not seen any laryngectomy while I was back in India, uh, but uh, now as I've seen some rich researches, there are laryngectomies in India. So you now you will see you. I don't know if you have already seen, but you will see. So always you remember that they have the right bed sign. Okay, laryngectomy. It should just flash like this that they are neck breathers and there is no connection between. Nose, mouth, and the lungs. There is no connection. Okay, so the opening just starts from here. So anything you need to do, give oxygen. You have to give oxygen through the stoma. Okay, so these are these things are called as larry tubes. Okay, they are flexible tubes. Okay, so these tubes are put into the uh, stoma. So patients with laryngectomies can speak. You see that that's a speaking valve. Okay, for a tracheostomy, we saw a different speaking valve, but for a laryngectomy, this is uh, it's called a TEP. Um, speech and language do it. We don't have much to do with it, um, <clears throat> so you just need to know that. So they put their they put their finger on that little hole there and they try and speak. Okay, so this is a laryngectomy. So your care now. You have a patient with laryngectomy. So you can take out the tube here, okay? Don't be afraid to take out the tube because it's a permanent stoma and it's an end stoma. So even if you take out the tube, no problem, okay? So that's why you see that the stoma is open, okay? So you use something called as uh, <clears throat> Pili's forceps, Pili's forceps, okay? So you give the patient a mirror and you ask the patient to inspect their. Um, stoma and if there is any dried secretion you just use these trees forceps and you take out the secretion because the most common problem here would be a uh, patient would have dried the secretion and that can be a cause for cardiac cardiopulmonary arrest okay the, this can happen so that's why it is very important that the patient has some kind of humidification again same principles like tracheostomy again, to have some kind of humidification. Okay, so as I showed you the pink thing, so it has an algorithm behind what to do in an emergency. Okay, the same steps here. So, <clears throat> so what you do is you can put in a tracheal tube. Anyone can put in a tracheal tube in the laryngectomy stoma. Okay, and then you connect your catheter mount and you can give oxygen. Okay. Uh, that is the only difference, but you can't intubate. You tell the anesthetist, sir, this is a laryngectomy. You cannot intubate. You just have to give oxygen through this. So even if you are giving oxygen, you give it through this, through the stoma. Okay, that's your laryngectomy emergencies. Okay, so the last thing, can you spot the difference? Now this is open. I think you can unmute them. You can spot the difference and tell me which is a laryngectomy and which is a tracheostomy.
Can you tell me the difference? The options is open, so you can unmute yourself to answer it, please. Okay, we can move, move, move on, uh, Lydia. I think that's it, sir. So we yeah. have come to an end of the presentation. So this is um, uh, a question. Is that the right, the, is that the right one? Uh, Tracheostomy and the left one is laryngectomy. We let the students answer. <laughs> well, there's no one trying. So no uh, one trying. No, they, they, they can put on. Uh, they, they can put the answer on chat box. Yes. 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 Please do no it. Okay. Um, anyone else has got questions in the meantime? Okay. Uh, we can stop sharing the screen, Lydia. Let's oh, go to the okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, Lydia, it was an excellent presentation. Uh, anyone has any questions? Yes. Yes, go ahead. Uh, how many hours we should inflate and deflate the tracheostomy tube cuff? So, how uh, often? How often? Uh, how often? Okay. Yeah. So, uh, if the cuff, we don't we don't inflate and deflate the cuff all the time. So, if the patient now it's again different. If the patient is in ICU and they are using the speaking valve, then the cuff is deflated. That means the patient is not on ventilator. Okay. So that time you can deflate the cuff. And again, if the patient is back on the ventilator, you know, sometimes patients have ventilator for 12 hours, 13 hours, and other times they are just on oxygen, on air home. So that time you deflate the cuff. But for normal patients on the ward, so we deflate the cuff, we leave it deflated. If they are vomiting, for example, and you notice that, the patient is vomiting and you suction and you are finding feed in the suction. That's when you inflate the cuff. Okay. But if cuff inflation means patient is still not doing good. If cuff is deflated means he's progressing. Is that okay? okay can I you. can I also give you another tip? Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, yes. Lydia. yes. If the patient's level of consciousness is less than... Uh, eight yes then uh, and if the cuff is deflated then you must make sure that the cuff is inflated just to protect the airway yes 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 definitely definitely because the patient does not have a swallow reflex so it is uh, important that you check the cuff pressure or the cuff even if you touch it you know yeah. if the cuff is inflated or deflated yeah yes okay um if you don't have a questions, I will have questions for the audience. Uh, sorry, one minute. Uh, I have one question from the uh, YouTube. Yeah. Um, Tarun Sebi, how to disinfect inner cannula? Okay. So uh, now what uh, we are following European guidelines here, which say, again, it depends from company to company. Here we are saying that we dispose, they are called disposable inner cannula that means if you see it is dirty you are going to throw it out and put a fresh one in but i'm not very sure what the local policies say but we usually say to discard the tube throw it away and am i right in saying that we need to take out inner cannula while we're suctioning uh, not necessarily you leave the inner cannula in and you suction. You don't need to take out the inner cannula because uh, we measure the, the, the suction catheter will still pass in through the inner cannula. Okay. Um, my next question is, um, okay, this is for the audience because you are not asking questions. I might as well ask you the questions because you seem to know it already. So when you got a patient with this uh, tracheostomy and you've been asked to suction this patient, how long will you suction this patient for? This is the audience uh, question for the audience. I, I, I guess some of you have looked after patients with tracheostomy, right? 
I'm sure the Angere team are nodding their head. Five to ten seconds. Five to ten seconds. Fifteen seconds. More than fifteen seconds, we should not section the session. Brilliant answer. Brilliant answer. Yes. Yes. Good. And uh, I guess you are all using humidified oxygen, right? In down here. Yes. Do you look after tracheostomy patients in the ward settings or ITU settings? ICU. Only in ICU. Only in ICU. Okay. Uh, if do we need an ICU bed for a patient with the tracheostomy? Yes or no? Is ICU an indication for a patient with tracheostomy? Uh, I say no. Yes. <laughs> yes. But then, 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 then it comes to the competencies. Whether you have a competent nurse who can look after the patient in the ward environment. Sorry, Lydia, I've taken over. <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, I, I have to acknowledge here, Sony, uh, for that one, uh, taking care of the patient, uh, you know, tracheostomy, uh, or who are all coming out of the tracheostomy in the ward settings. So, uh, Lydia, anyway, this was a very nice session. So, I must say that uh, it was refreshing me. So, now I'm a psychiatric nurse working here in. Uh, UK over the last uh, 18 years, but I'm now going back to 25 years ago when I was working in Manipur yeah. Hospital. Yeah. So I have the, you know, I did work on the ICU, you yes. know, uh, work with the tracheostomy patient as well. And, um, you know, it is really refreshing uh, for me. Uh, I must acknowledge that uh, when I was in the ward in Manipur Hospital that time, uh, the patient who had a tracheostomy, the suddenly they become breathless, not able yeah. to breathe. Yeah. The patient was in the non-oxygen room. There was yes. no central oxygen. Yes. So a uh, patient needed emergency oxygen to connect. Yes. So yes. what I have to do, I was in the ninth floor. Yes. So I can't wait for others to attend or bring the oxygen trolley, whatever it is. Yes. Yes. So to be honest, I become a hero in that day. So <laughs> what I did, I lift the patient in my both hand and okay. move to the other area where the yeah. central oxygen was supplied. Okay, okay. So that was the interesting thing for me to share with you. That is the one thing yes. only when <laughs> it has to be a patient who required the oxygen level, you know, yes. and I'm remembering that thing. Anyway, thank you yes. very much for- <laughs> Thank you, thank you, sir, for sharing that. You know, uh, this, every situation and every scenario is very different. So uh, you cannot, you cannot, you cannot predict what the patient's outcome would be. But if you have these things, okay, in place, if you have your tracky tray, if you have your oxygen working bedside, see sometimes now, uh, so we have started here now, some patients go uh, to different hospitals or they go for radiotherapy to a different setting. So transporting this patient becomes difficult. So mm -hmm. you need to have, you cannot, a nurse cannot travel and you know, with the patient to another hospital just for the sake of radiotherapy because of nursing shortage. So we have started training healthcare assistants who are just competent in taking care of these patients. So what happens? So they have an emergency, they have suction catheters, they have suction equipment, but still it it, it, it is it's quite a challenging job. Not everyone will be able to do it. It will just take a lot of practice and it needs your guts. It really needs your guts. So, but if you know what steps to follow, what exactly to do. So I encounter patients, so I my bleep just goes off, you know, it just goes off. They, they ring me, they say, I have a patient here. So I just have to be there in a second. Sometimes I don't have things. So using the best thing, whatever is available there, using your common sense, you know, you just assessing your environment, you see what best you can do. And uh, that's how you need to uh, uh, save your patient. Uh, so I must say, uh, well done, sir, uh, for what you did 25 years ago. Uh, uh, Thank you. Um, yes. Yeah. Other things to remember in the ward settings is uh, especially because the staffing ratio is really so poor. I mean, whether it's in India or UK, it's the same settings. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's almost similar. Uh, that uh, if you don't have a competent uh, staffing levels, 
uh, within the, your clinical areas, I think you should uh, decline admissions or with tracheostomy. So that's one of the criteria. If you don't have a trained staff to look after patients in the ward environment, it is unsafe for the patient and is also unsafe, uh, not fair on the staff if you don't have the adequate training. So that's where the competencies comes in. That's where the, uh, the training issues comes in. So you must always resist taking a patient if you haven't looked after a patient with tracheostomy. Okay. That's one thing. Yes, you should be able to say, like, I need training and uh, till we get the training, let the patient stay in another ward and then we can receive the patient. So this part, I think, becomes a little difficult uh, in our settings to say, to say no, but uh, I think it's better to say that you don't know than to yeah. risk yourself and the patient's life. Absolutely. So, so yeah, there are refresher courses for those of you who uh, have forgotten. Okay, for example, like if, I, if I'm not doing this for five, six years, I will forget it. So there are refresher courses. You can, you can get, in, uh, get yourself trained with that. Yeah. And um, yeah. Okay, the other thing is if you have a patient with tracheostomy and you do have a competencies, but you have this, this patient, like Lydia said, in an acute condition, you need to have a close monitoring just in case if they pull out the tube where you need a, almost at a one to one level care. Or uh, in the, under those circumstances, you need to make sure you place the patient in, uh, in a location where there is constant supervision, perhaps close to the nurse station where there's someone all the time. And, and the second thing is you must have a tracheostomy uh, uh, backup kit, like Lydia mentioned. Uh, and the person who's nominated to look after the patient should be aware of all the equipment and make sure they check it at each shift when they take a handover. You must make sure when you take a handover, you go through the tracheostomy kit, uh, emergency kit, and make sure all the equipment is there. That could be misplaced easily. So these are all practical tips that I have learned when I looked after patients with the tracheostomy and respiratory wards. And you must always, always make sure that the staffing level is adequate for the next 24 hours each shift when you make when you come in. Make sure you have got enough staffing who is trained, not just adequate staffing, who is trained to look after a patient with uh, tracheostomy. Uh, a humidified oxygen is another thing. I know some of the hospitals still don't have centralized oxygen supplies. So you must make sure you have the humidified oxygen uh, supplies uh, and and then the emergency contact details for anesthetists not everyone has the same bleep system or the pager system that you have in uh, in we have in uk you have a different arrangements in india and understand that how does it work in uh, Daungere or anybody else for that matter uh, anybody can unmute and say how do you contact uh, anesthetist or who do you contact in the emergency Nine number, sir. Nine number, yes, yes. Nine number. Yeah. Nine is the local telephone. Nine. nine is nine is your switchboard, right? Switchboard. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. Nine switchboard phone one our phone at the now nine number call Madi Daga sir on our anesthetist to connect Martare. Immediately they will come here. I see. Is, 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 okay. My question is is nine an emergency? Yeah. So if you want to make an outside call, what will you dial? Nine. <laughs> Sister, you here want to call? Huh? Here in, in the hospital, in another emergency address, nine number in our connection to what they call Matsu. Outside in the no idea. Allah, sister. See, there is a what I'm trying to differentiate is in an emergency, there should be a fast track way of dialing for somebody. Okay. <laughs> You don't have that uh, amount of time. Every second is important. You need to make sure that you get some help within five minutes. So you dial the switchboard at nine. Uh, then somebody picks up. So they take their own time. How will they differentiate? That is yours is emergency. On duty so, call. What I'm trying to. Sister. I still live. Waglu on duty or itar ella sir. Alla I see na itar sister. We wardal kal si thera patient. We covid. Yalla thera covid di thega. There is covid everywhere, right? So you. If your ICU is full of covid patients, you they will push the like a patient to the ward. So 
how will you look after the pay yeah deal with an emergency na mobile ina maartar sir ah there you go that's it that's it and um, <laughs> somebody somebody is chatting to somebody on whatsapp or somebody is dialing somebody and you get another call from this is not this is not the right way that's what i'm trying to say essentially you should be able to differentiate what is emergency and what is non non emergency so Thank that you. is the system that they have to introduce right okay sir i mean that is something for you to consider about change in practices uh, uh, in your in your clinical settings for uh, for, uh, for 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 example what we do is uh, in uk we dial uh, 2222 2222 is a universal number uh, sorry across uk anywhere you dial any hospital internal phones you call 2222 it's an emergency any hospital you go 2222 is an emergency outside the hospital settings it's 999 or 911 anywhere you call you get uh, you get emergency help so likewise each hospital should have some emergency contact numbers so if you dial that they even the switchboard should realize that it's an emergency number they have to prioritize your calls okay any other questions from the audience thank you so much lydia it was a lovely presentation it was quite refreshing even uh, you, even after 10 years uh, i'm glad i i had some memories left in my brain still uh, but thank you it was such a lovely presentation i hope you uh, the audience enjoyed it too so yes it can be if you are not using if you are not in this area of tracheostomy it can be like i don't know anything or why should i know uh, but you never know now how uh, things are changing with covid Uh, we have had so many patients with tracheostomy now so and you know icu beds are limited so they'll be obviously pushed to the ward and you will be made to take care of them overnight so it's just uh, you know so that's how the ch- uh, times are now so it's it's very important that you just get to learn you know and you can always contact me if you want to know anything more um Yes so I still want to come back to my last uh, thing uh, you know on the screen to spot the difference uh, can anyone spot the difference I think only swami is the one uh, spot the difference I believe <laughs> uh, I want, I don't know whether it was right or wrong <laughs> can anyone still spot the difference you have to share the tracheostomy yeah do uh, जक्टमी first one tracheostomy second one uh, laryngectomy first uh, laryngectomy two will be flexible two will sir okay anybody else i think i am with the same the first one is uh, tracheostomy okay that's good anyone else It's a, it's a it's a free i'm not charging you you can tell me <laughs> you can just give it a guess and see uh, uh, so you you are saying okay i'll go i'll go the opposite i say right one is tracheostomy i think and the left is laryngectomy what do the students want to say look like there's no students left they're all gone they're all gone mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not an emergency you don't have to run away okay let me just tell you you cannot know the difference as i told you behind the dressing you don't know what kind of stoma it is you will never be able to know 
whether it's a tracheostomy or a laryngectomy, because even in a laryngectomy patient, you can put a trachea tube. So if they both look similar, the only way you can know the difference is with your bed signs. Okay, so it's just very important that you have, uh, see, you can download this from, uh, uh, I have downloaded it from tracheostomy.org.uk and you can make it, you know, uh, uh, for your uh, own hospital. But this is the only way that we will know if the tube is in place, uh, we cannot differentiate unless you have the bet signs. So it was a good try, I must say. <laughs> well done, all of you. Uh, and thank you very much. Uh, Lydia, can you share that link for me, uh, the website link? Sure, so I can sure. Share it, share it sure, I, I can. I will, I will send the link. I should yeah. have put it on my slide, but I can, I'll send it to you. Thank you. Yeah, well, once again, uh, thank you very much, Lydia, for your time to be with us uh, for more than one hour now already. So good audience. Uh, thank you very much, audience as well, especially SS hospitals. Uh, always they are very cooperative with us. Thank you. you know, we're trying to you know, support them with their clinical knowledge. You know, I hope they are uh, somewhat, they are um, you know, um, taking our, uh, some of the advice or the suggestion, you know, information. So thank you very much once, uh, again, once again. And um, our next session um, is, uh, is on the 1st of May. Uh, which is the same time, it will be non-invasive ventila ventilation. Am I right, uh, Swami? Yes, uh, I think uh, um, like, I, like today, the next one is uh, uh, another airway session. Next one, uh, it's about non-invasive ventilation, especially COVID time, it's, uh, it's probably going to be a precious one as well. Uh, we're talking about the BiPAP and CPAP in the, and as well as oxygenation. Mm -hmm. So please do make sure that uh, make, uh, all of you participate and convey the message to your colleagues as well. We'll be sharing the link soon. Yeah, it's just, uh, you know, getting the knowledge or information. You don't have to be in this particular area. You don't have to be working in that specific area. You know, I'm a psychiatric nurse anyway, but still I'm very, very much interested, you know, uh, refreshing other thing as well. So the same thing I would suggest everyone to join for the our next session. Uh, once again, thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Swami. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to take this time to, uh, I can see my teachers from SDM. So I want to just take this time to say thank you to all of you for joining in, sir and madam. And uh, uh, thank you so much. Thank you, and, uh, thank you. And, thank you. Uh, thank you, dear audience. Uh, you have been wonderful. And thank you, Swami sir and Suresh sir, uh, for giving me this opportunity to uh, is share a little bit. <laughs> who is your teacher from uh, SS Hospital? I think I can see uh, David sir and I can see uh, Mani Vichli madam oh. and uh, oh. Nagesh sir. They're all my teachers from SDM. Oh, that's so, very nice. So I'm, I'm very, very, very privileged. <laughs> I'm definitely yeah, there. Appreciate you. I'm sure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. See you in your next session. Thank you. Thank you.